Misandry in the News, with Paul Elam and Tom Golden, episode number one. Welcome, I'm Tom Golden, and with me today is my good buddy, Paul Elam. Paul, good to have you here. Good to be here, thank you very much. And if you knew truckers, you wouldn't call me a good buddy. Good buddy, <laughs> now tell me about that. In, well, in trucking vernacular, that is, um, let's say, reserved for those men who are a little light in the loafers. <laughs> okay, good buddy. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you why we're here. We're starting a new series called Misandry in the News. And Misandry in the News is going to be our picking four articles that we see misandry in the news. And we're going to talk about those. We're going to bat them around and have a good time with them and bring them to you. And we also want you to be involved. So... Here's how we're going to do it. Uh, my Twitter account is trgolden, at trgolden. If you've got an idea about a news program you think we should do, just send me a direct message to at trgolden. Tell me what it is. Give me a link. And I can't guarantee a response, but we'll certainly look at it and consider it. And if you would like to be a part of this, we're going to have one guest each show. And come on in. And Paul says the only uh, criterion is that you can't be crazy. Is that right, Paul? Or at least not crazier than, than me and Tom. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, crazy on the same level. There. We don't, just a, a little bit crazy is good, but not, not too, too crazy. <laughs> yeah, so we want to involve you in this. So DM me on Twitter. Let us know what you got an article, and uh, we'll see what we can do from there. Anyway, uh, let's get started, Paul. The, uh, Paul's picked two articles, and I've picked two, and, and we'll start off with the one that I picked. <laughs> It's about this woman who's a professor who did a study, and the study was on homeless men. And you know what she did? She looked at how do these homeless men display hegemonic masculinity or toxic masculinity? <laughs> I mean, can you believe it? You know, I want to say, no, you're making this shit up. It didn't happen. No, it couldn't possibly be real. Because, I mean, how could you possibly pick on homeless people to make a political point about hegemonic masculinity? But I take it you are serious. She actually did do this. Here's this. The goal of her research, she explains, was to assess the ways hyper-masculinity is performed among men experiencing homelessness. And to do this... She interviewed 27 homeless men and spent an additional 296 hours spying on them in homeless shelters. <laughs> and of course, what does she conclude? She concludes that these men were hegemonic masculinity types and that they blamed women for everything. They blamed women for their homelessness, these terrible sorts. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Reading through this thing, I just could not believe it. You know, they talk about victim blaming, right? Oh, don't blame the victim. But this woman goes in. Here are these guys who are literally victims of homelessness. What does she do? She talks about how they're bad people. Oh, my God. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, this is straight out of the feminist playbook. This is how they've characterized when they talk about problems like domestic violence. They yes. reframe things that come to us from things like mental illness, poverty, uh, all other kinds of problems that contribute to things like domestic violence also contribute to homelessness. Yes. And so she takes out, well, they're mentally ill and replaces that with hegemonic masculinity. She, um, these are, I, I just come to the conclusion, these are bad people. I was I'm not say, talking about the homeless. I'm talking about whatever professor would take a population that's sleeping under bridges and find a way to demonize them and to further ostracize them and alienate them from society around them and make people not trust them and avoid them and not want to help them. Uh, it takes them an evil bitch to do something like that. To blame them. And evil was the word I was going to use. I mean, that's just, it's just beyond the, the comprehension of most people that someone could do that. I mean, it's like taking someone who's uh, got, a, got a particular disease and then saying how oh, people with that disease are just terrible people. You know, it's like, are you kidding me? 
It's just absolutely insane. But I think you're exactly right. And that is that they try and frame men in general as being bad, terrible people. And this is just one more avenue for them to blame. And while we're at it, folks, victims of suicide, which are predominantly male, that's hegemonic masculinity. Uh, if they weren't, you know, toxically masculine, they probably would have lived. They would probably have not killed themselves if they weren't patriarchs. Exactly. I mean, I'm joking about this, but this is some of the sickest stuff I can possibly imagine. And this stuff goes on in an academic environment where this woman, excuse me, this bitch is getting pats on the back from her peers yes. for this kind of work. Nobody's challenging this stuff. No, I mean, we're going to challenge it here on our, you know, very small market uh, of, of men's rights audience and MGTOW audience. We're going to challenge that stuff here. But in the population in general, in our academic environment, the universities, this is what they want. This is what they're producing these days. Pure hatred, pure it, hatred. It is actually in a book on patriarchy. You know, it's one of the chapters in a book on patriarchy. Uh, that mythical thing in the sky, patriarchy. Oh, well. It sort of reminds me, and we could have also have done a story too of the, you know, because this is basically the same kind of crowd. The Antifa uh, people that were, um, a bunch of white guys in Philadelphia screaming at Candace Owens about white supremacy, who happens to be a black female, um, throwing water on people and screaming at, at black people and at black police officers about white supremacy. And these are what, you know, 20 something, late teens, early 20s, people of privilege. <laughs> Uh, it, and it, it, they just make up anything, anything to further the hatred, uh, the class hatred, the gender hatred. It's disgusting. And I just wonder when, when at some point somebody's going to step up and start doing something about this of substance. I hope so, because you can't make this shit up. No, you, you know, can't. It's hard to imagine anybody making up a bunch of white guys screaming in a black woman's ear about white supremacy. It's just... What? Absolutely insane. It is hard to make. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, mm -hmm. if you tried to submit this in Hollywood as a screenplay, the producers would just throw it out. Sorry, not plausible. Never happened. <laughs> yeah, well, it did. Uh, uh, by the Hollywood crowd, by and large. Indeed. You want to go on to your one of your Yeah, I mean, as long as we're talking about unbridled hatred, let's talk about the SPLC for a minute. Who? Oh, oh, by the way, there will be links to all of these articles in case you think Tom and I are making this shit up. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you if you suspected that, but there will be links to all this uh, uh, documenting what we're saying. The SPLC just did another report, uh, this one entitled, this one titled, excuse me, I have this terrible thing of saying entitled. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm thinking of feminist. Yes. But this one is titled uh, SPLC, uh, SPLC Hate Watch Hate in Europe. And it covered the recent conference by A Voice for Men and Justice for Men and Boys as a hate conference. Um, and of course, they conveniently omitted a lot of facts, like uh, they tried to make it look like it was a crowd of nothing but men. That was a lie. They tried to make it look like it was a crowd of nothing but whites. That was a lie. Um, they neglected to mention all the female speakers uh, that came out, including the keynote <laughs> address coming from Karen Strawn and other speakers like Elizabeth Hobson and, and Janice Fiamingo. Um, they just absolutely trashed the conference, the, did not get into any of the substance, did not link to any of the talks that are now online or any of the past conferences. And it's just one more round of hate Meanwhile, in a related story, I'll just have you know, Morris Dees, the co-founder, uh, and we'll put this link in the low bar, the co-founder of the, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has really nothing to do with poverty or the law. Really? <laughs> it, it's, oh, just a, it's just a money-raising scam is all it is anymore. Uh, Morris Dees, it seems, was uh, 
named in his divorce settlement as trying to perv out on his 18-year-old stepdaughter, uh, peeking at her through her bedroom window oh, and, and trying to get her to play with herself with a vibrator in front of him. Yes, it is all there, folks, and it will be linked in the low bar. Um, this is the kind of people that are labeling me as a hate monger, uh, is perverts who are lying to the public like Morris D's uh, in order to raise a bunch of money. Um, this is sad, or the, as it's once been said, it's a sad and beautiful world. Sometimes it's a sick and beautiful world. Uh, and this is one example. Of and that. they do raise a lot of money. Apparently they're worth a third of a billion dollars right now. Most of which is held in offshore accounts. Yes. And what most people don't know about Mr. D is the uh, originator of the SPLC is that he was given an award for direct marketer of the year, I think in 1999, and that his forte is marketing and raising money. And that's just what he's done. With oh, gee, you think? <laughs> and I'll tell you something else I learned about Mr. D's, and that is that his, um, the SPLC one year used 13% of their income for programs. 13%. The rest went to, as you can imagine, Salaries <laughs> or what? Salaries, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And they pay themselves ridiculously well. Yeah. An average nonprofit uses about 75% of their money that they take in uh, for programs. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about how this guy is, is uh, working things. He's a shyster. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people out there have called him a shyster and a crook. And there's a lot of writing out there. We'll probably give a couple of links about, about how he is literally. Uh, been called a, a shyster and a crook for good reason. Well, and he recently, at least his organization, just had to cut a check for a little over $3 million for libeling a reformed Muslim extremist who started a campaign to, to address the problem of Muslim extremism. Yes. And uh, he labeled the guy as an extremist, put him on the hate watch list, and the guy turned around, sued his ass, and got three million bucks. Uh, for you're it. AVFM could use three million bucks. Yes, AVFM could use three million bucks, but if we're not going to get the three million bucks, I tell you what, I will settle for the Schadenfreude of watching Morris D's write checks to people, to other people he's libeled. Yes. Uh, for $3 million. Also note, uh, if you follow the link uh, to the SPLC article in the description area below, you'll see that a lot of people came in to refute what was being said in that article. And you'll also note in many of the comments how the people at the SPLC have been selectively slicing comments out of it to make it look, uh, you know, not to, to try to give away their blatant censorship, but they're trying to con their way into making it look like they allowed people to speak when they weren't. My last comment was deleted. Yeah. Yeah. In, in essence, they don't play fair, you know, and they are cheaters and liars. And they're slime balls. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. of them. But of course, that's not news to anybody. I mean, and at least now you get to see that the conservative establishment, you, people like Tucker Carlson and such are interviewing their victims and starting to yes. get it out in the media. Finally, yeah. what a corrupt money grubbing yes. bunch of shysters that the SPLC is. But he has really learned how to take hate and leverage it into money because he knows that hate sells. He writes out these direct marketing things and he says, are you against hate? Everyone, yes, you know, of course I am. Can you give us a little bit of money? You know, Are you against oh. misogyny? Are you against men that try to promote rape and domestic violence against women? Men like Paul Elam? Please oh, give us money. Um, oh, God. And, of course, the you know, P.T. Barnum said it right. There's one born every minute, and yeah. they give him the money. Exactly right. And what a lot of his victims, and I call them his victims, the people that give him money are being conned and manipulated. A lot of them were people with genuine civil rights concerns out of the 70s that are now senior citizens. Uh, and yes. that's who they're preying on, is yeah. the people who were supporting them 
back when the SPLC actually did some good work by suing the KKK uh, and a couple of other things, but they have totally gone off the rails since then, but they're going back to appeal to people who remember them being actual, you know, advocates for, for justice in this world, and they're exploiting them by creating more fear for them yes. to throw money at. Precisely. Well said. Well said. It's sort of like ripping off, you know, retirees with phone scams. Yep. And I say it's sort of like that. I shouldn't. Yes. That's what it is. We are the IRS. You owe so much money. <laughs> you know, call this number. We will fix it up. We can help you. <laughs> Crazy crap, eh? Crazy crap. How about the next one? Okay, yeah, let's let's move on. What's your what's your next one, Tom? Right, let's do your next one. Oh. We'll do Tom Paul Paul Tom. Okay, Tom Paul Paul Tom it is. I like that. Uh, next one, speaking of slime balls, <laughs> of literal pieces of shit, let's talk about Michael Kimmel. <laughs> who is the gender studies professor featured in the Red Pill movie, who said that the men's movement was the gender version of the white nationalist movement, oh, all God. other kinds of hyperbole and bullshit. Uh, Michael Kimmel is an extraordinary liar. He's an ex extraordinary manipulator. He has conned his way into the hearts of many feminists, but oh, wait. He was hitting on one of his students. <laughs> he just got me too Oh, boy. And uh, the student, of course, Anonymous, has levied the complaint that while she was under his wing academically, he suggested to her that because she was so attractive that she would have to work harder to be taken credibly and suggested that she do that in his bedroom. <laughs> Which, does the name Hugo Schweitzer ring a bell? Oh, God, I didn't even thought about that name for a long time. But it's the same pattern. It's just like the televangelist who rages about porno and rages about, you know, loose women and prostitution. And then you see him get caught buying a $5 hooker. <laughs> <laughs> And so here now is Michael Kimmel, who was about to receive some sort of bullshit, you know, backslapping award that they, yes. they give gender ideologues. Yeah. And now who has said he's, he's really doing the right thing here. He said, I'm going to defer accepting that award by six months to allow these people to speak, you know, whoever has complaints to be heard. And he's made a pledge to support the right they have to their perception, which is another version of, you know, believe the woman and uh, first believe. Isn't that what they say? First, you must believe. Yeah, it's the believe the victim. Well, there, uh, there is a, a article at a place called medium.com that really raked him over the coals, which is what feminists do to each other. Uh, anytime there's one, there's a little blood in the water. Yep. Uh, especially go. the male feminist, under the bus you go, and now they throw Michael. And I mind you, and it is important to say this, these are allegations. There has been no proof. The person making the allegations is anonymous um, and being hidden. Uh, Michael Kimmel, does he deserve due process? Yes, he does. Does yes. he deserve the presumption of innocence? Yes, he absolutely does. Yes. And I tell you what, I like the way this looks on this son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't wish it on a, I mean, again, in a matter of principle, he deserves due process. He deserves yes. the presumption of innocence yes. like any other man. Exactly. I'll defend that to my dying breath. Yes. Uh, I cannot resist the poetic justice uh, involved here when this, immoral scumbag, Michael Kimmel, furthering an agenda of hate for the past 30 years, gets bitten by the very kind of monster he worked so hard to create. Yes. Um, it works for me. It looks good. I like it, in other words. Yes. Thoughts, Tom? 
very satisfying to see him in the position that he has been critical of for so long. You know, it's just, it's just, oh, I mean, he's going to have to deal with things now and he's going to start thinking, hmm, maybe these MRAs are right about this false accusation thing. <laughs> you don't well, think so? He'll say, well, it was right in my case, but no other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only me. Me and Hugo Schweitzer. <laughs> We ought to put a link to Hugo Schweitzer's story in there. We've got a few articles on that at ABFM. You talk about a, <laughs> you talk about a scumbag oh, feminist. Yeah. Of course, I repeat myself. Uh, for years, he told MRAs that they were, you know, these horrible people, and and that you couldn't trust them, and la 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 la. And of course, then it turned out that old Hugo was just not all he banged up to be. Yep, him, Hugo Schweitzer, Michael Kimmel, Harvey Weinstein. What's the fucking difference? <laughs> None to me. Not the <laughs> let, same, them, let them all go under the bus. Uh, we'll still be out here pushing for people to get due process. I was going to we'll still be out here challenging the Me Too crooked narrative that allows for women to remember alleged abuses from 20, 30 years back and step up and have the whole society falling all over themselves to give them a platform and to give them credibility that they quite frankly don't deserve. Yeah. I don't believe. If somebody doesn't say anything about it at the time, and if they do say something about it at the time, if they stand up against the odds and make their case, then they have my support for speaking up. But people that wait 10, 20, 30 years, wait till some guy's 80 years old like Bill Cosby and look at how can I angle this into a civil suit so I can grab some of his money while he's on his way to prison? No, I don't believe you. I think you're all lying. Yeah. There's motive sure is there, you know, with money stuff. Absolutely. Oh, but yeah. I, <laughs> I really appreciate your speaking up for due process. Because I think that's really important for us to say and to, and to also support him with that, you know, that he does, he is entitled to due process and he is innocent until proven guilty. But and I do support God, him. It does feel good to see him squirm in the same thing that he's described about us for so many years, you know, let him squirm. And you know something, all of his posturing about this, about how he wants to listen to the alleged victim and, and all this other stuff, it won't save him at all. Yeah. It won't save him a bit. They are going to crucify him, throw him under the bus. It'll never matter if the accusation ever gets proven. He has, in so many words, denied it saying that he didn't have a recollection of treating anybody unfairly. And it also brings the question, which I think this is a good enough place to raise it. What was alleged about Kimmel was that he propositioned a PhD student, a PhD candidate to sleep with him, that he did it while she was getting her PhD. And then again, afterward, as she entered professional life. And question is to me, so what? So what? Is, is propositioning an adult for sex a criminal offense or something to, that you should be destroyed over? I, I think Michael should be destroyed for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but just not that one. I think that, you know, the argument would be that he was in a position of power over her. and He was using that power without really... Um, much concern for her he was using it for his concerns and for his gain. So, and, and there's something to be said for that. Like a therapist, you know, having sex with a, a patient, you know? Well, yeah. And that, well, yeah, that to me is a sort of a, a, because, you know, there are some schools that don't have any policies that prohibit fraternization. Uh, they're out there. Yeah. Um, and I take your point. Well, that he would be in a position of authority over her. Yes. Um, there was no allegation in everything that I read. And we're, again, we're going to be linking this story below. There was no allegation in anything I read that there was any sort of retaliation from him or anything like that. Right. And again, 
I'm not making a defense or an attack either way on him regarding the merits of this case. There is nothing but an accusation. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing else there. That's true. It was sort of bizarre, though, that he would tell her that that, <laughs> that she needed to uh, prove to others that she wasn't sleeping with someone by sleeping with someone. Yes. Like, Wait a minute. That doesn't compute. That's feminist logic, man. Are you <laughs> kidding? That compute the whole crazy. To Michael Kimmel. That's the way that fucker thinks. God, that's fucking crazy. I mean, just... Up is down. <laughs> yes. Left is right. Not so. Inside is outside. Black is white. Um, so. Okay, you got to work harder as a woman to prove yourself, says the feminist professor who wants a blowjob. <laughs> that sums it up, actually. Oh, well, yeah. So anyway, talking about misandry in the news, uh, like every other form of hatred, misandry, anti-male stuff like this will come back and bite everyone. It'll bite women. It'll bite men. It'll bite the the feminist purveyors of it. They will eventually get it. And if Michael Kimmel is catching this one, catching this bullet for the team, he won't be the last. Yeah. Expect it to happen to Michael Flood. Expect it to happen to a lot of others. Yes, guys, you guys that get out there and think you're being a hero to women by demonizing men, by telling lies about them, they, Michael Kimmel's your example. They will come for you. Hugo Schweitzer is your example. They'll come for you, and they will chew you up and spit you out. And the only people that will offer any kind of defense for you, well, you're listening to two of them right now. There you go. That about sums it up. You want to go to the last one? Yeah, let's go to the last one. It was Paul, to, uh, Tom, Paul, Paul. Now it's time for Tom. PPPT. Yeah. Yes. And... We're going to try and save uh, the last one to be one that's more positive. And uh, the first three have certainly been dripping in negative. So we're going to make the last one positive. And it's a great story about a guy, Professor Mark Perry. And Mark Perry is someone who has been taking it to the uh, ropes with the feminists and the colleges. And what he's doing is he's literally using Title IX and using uh, the Office of Civil Rights to show where there are situations where uh, men are being discriminated against. And one example was um, there was a study hall at the University of Michigan, I think. And the study hall was for women only in the student union. Only women could be there. And so Perry filed a complaint. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. that's not fair. You should, if you have something in the student union, it should be for all students, not just for a, a subset. And so sure enough, I mean, after a while, he tapped away at it and he was successful in getting them to shift that from being an all woman's study place into a co-ed study place. So that's, that's pretty important stuff. And he's been doing more and more and more of this. In fact, Paul, one of the things I really want to do is get a hold of, of Dr. Perry and have him see if we can get him to teach us how to do what he's doing, you know, because the more we can learn about that, the more we can take complaints into the civil rights office or complaints into title nine, uh, the more we can make things happen quickly. And there is nothing I would like more than to be able to make a series of tutorials about yes. how to make Title IX complaints. And yes. one of the things that came up as I was discussing this was Tom, was that you do not have to be a student at a particular university in order to file a Title IX complaint. You can Correct. just be aware of the discrimination Correct. and you can file it and they have to respond to it. And man, there's a lot of stuff out there where it's women only this and women only that. I saw the University of Maryland had this uh, women's health thing, and there's bragging about all this stuff for you know women and the women's health. So I wrote to them. I said, "Great stuff. You got a a, a, a women's health center for for women in Maryland. Is there a men's health center?" And they wrote back fairly quickly. No. There's no men's health center. It's only for women. So I wrote him back and I said, really? I said, do you think that might be a Title IX infraction? She wrote back really fast. She said, no, it's not a Title IX infraction. It could have been in all caps. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> and the second sentence was, and we don't answer frivolous questions. We don't answer frivolous questions. I wrote her back and I said, 
thanks for considering my question non-frivolous since you did answer. <laughs> but, you know, these people, they get very defensive about being challenged for, for this all women stuff because it's not right. I mean, if you're going to have what Perry says is either you dump all the old women's all women stuff or you create a situation where it's for both or you create a situation where men have a similar um, what's the word for it? Uh, a similar service, you know, and one of those three, any of those three would be fine, you know. So we will try and get in touch with Dr. Perry, and hopefully he's going to help us learn how to do this. There's another guy that did a workshop in North Carolina that's teaching people how to do this. I want to try and find him too and see if we can uh, get some of these guys to teach us how to do things and then teach everybody out there how to do it. Man, can you imagine 100 200, 500 people around the country putting complaints in. I mean, that could make a dent in things. 10 guys doing that would create a firestorm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I was 100 or 200 or 500, but 10 guys doing that could create a firestorm. And in case, folks, if you're listening to this and watching today, and we're not able to to get a hold of Dr. Perry, if there's no response or whatever, if any of you out there might have access to this information, know something about it, um, please contact Tom at the um, Twitter address. That at TR Golden. At TR Golden, um, because we will follow up on that. Um, and like I said, I would be ecstatic if I could get all the details on how to file these complaints with title on Title IX. And let me make clear why. I don't subscribe to the myth of equality between the sexes. I, I really don't. I mean, the sexes aren't equal any, any more than two people. Uh, me and Tom aren't equal. There's some things Tom does better than me, some things I do better than Tom. He's taller and, than I am. Yeah, people aren't equal and much less groups aren't equal. This is not a political thing. What this is, is, an, is one way to possibly undermine funding for ideologues mm. and to screw up their plans to indoctrinate far and wide as far as they can get it. So this isn't to me, you know, this isn't truth and justice in the American way, and we're going to get all, all the services for men that they're giving to women. I mean, that's certainly a noble goal for those that want to pursue it. I want to pursue this because I want to destroy the work of feminists on campus. I like that. That's I'm, my motive. Yeah. I like yes, that. you can quote me on that. God I, damn it. I, I, I'm telling you, the indoctrination on campuses is just so incredible, and it's done so much damage that I'm all for tearing it apart, man. Oh, boy. So, yeah, that's one way to do it. So, are we about finished? That sounds like a wrap to me. That was four. Yeah, it's four. And, and so I like ending on a positive, hopeful note. Yeah. Good old Dr. Perry. He's going to yeah. find us, and we're going to find him, and we're going to go from there, and we'll let you guys know what's happening. And so we're going to do over. some FTSU. FTSU, a lot of it. And so thank you all for being with us today. And keep in mind that men are good, as are you. Yes, they are. Yeah. So we'll see you next time. All right? Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>